Sing. Did you recognize those two songs? There's two in a melody. What were they? Sweet by and by. Isn't that what it's all about this week? So that we all go to the sweet by and by? But in order to get there, you must be? You must be what? Born again. All right. And the second one was? No, there's another one, the end one. There you go. Revive us again. A little different. Uh, revive us again. All right. Well, I want to thank, uh, ahead of time, I want to thank our, our guest speaker and traveler and uh, preacher, and they just did a marvelous job, and he's going to wind it up. He's down the last mile, on the last mile, and uh, thank each one of you who have come out tonight, and I know the Lord has blessed you, and we're going to get blessed here again tonight, so thank you very much. It won't be the last time. We'll have you back, that's for sure. So let's sing that uh, theme song that we have, Revive Us Again. Would you stand? <clears throat> And if I'd have thought of it, I'd have thrown in that third verse for the, for the Methodist sitting here, and I forgot. Bobby's getting ready there. We'll have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that we can come back here tonight. We pray that you prepared our hearts for what the Holy Spirit has for us for our brother Kenny. We pray that you'd be with him. Be with your word as it comes forth. May it give it to each one of us something that we can take with us to walk not only throughout this week, but throughout the rest of this year and walk in the footpath that you have prepared for each one of us in your good and in your perfect will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bobby. Good evening. Sometimes when I'm feeling lonesome and no one on earth seems to care I'm all by myself in the darkness with no one and nothing to share just when it feels like it's over I'll never make it alone I hear the voices of angels tenderly calling me home. Home, come on home. Ye who are we, we come home. Softly and tender they call me. Home, come on home. 
I try to keep it together And I never let on that I'm scared Till sometimes I fall to pieces Scattered and lost everywhere And just when it feels like it's hopeless I'll never make it alone I hear the voice deep inside me It's tenderly calling me home Home, come on home He who are weary, come home Softly and tender, they call me Home, come on home Don't be afraid of the darkness And don't run away from the storm Stand up and face your reflection And feelings you try to ignore Cause after the tempest is over You let yourself go on through You'll hear a voice in the silence It's tenderly calling to you Home, come on home Ye who are weary, come home Softly and tender, they're calling Home, come on home I hear the voices of angels Tenderly calling me This was requested from me uh, two or three weeks ago, and uh, I like to do requests for people because a lot of times they have something that they want to share, and maybe they don't know how to share it, so I try to share it for them. Pat, this one's for you. I thought number one would surely be me. I thought I could be what I wanted to be. I thought I could build on life sinking sand. But now I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I thought I could do a lot on my own. I thought I could make it all day long Thought of myself as a mighty big man But Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand Oh Lord, I can't walk without you holding my hand The mountains too high And the valleys too wide Down on my knees That's where I learn to stand Oh Lord, I can't even walk Without you holding my hand I think I'll make Jesus My all in all 
And if I'm in trouble, on his name I'll call. If I didn't trust him, to be less than a man. Cause Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Oh Lord, I can't walk without you holding my hand. The mountains too high And the valleys too wide Down on my knees That's where I learn to stand Cause Lord I can't even walk Without you holding my hand Oh Lord I can't even walk Without you holding my hand I hope that you all have been enjoying the special music each evening. I think it's been wonderful. In fact, let's give a hand to all of those who have been sharing their talents and music for us. It's been a special blessing, that's for sure. And now, you know, it's interesting. I've been watching certain people as we have gone on during the week, and the front row all of a sudden now is on the back row. They started out up here, and now they're in the back row. And I told them when they came in, if they sat back there, that was the, that was the sinner's row. That's where the sinners will continue to uh, pray about it until we get, we get you taken care of. No, not really. But it is good to have all of you here. And I want you to stand right now. Stand up. And turn around and tell, to look at two people and say, God loves you, and I'm trying. God loves you and I'm trying. God loves you and I'm trying. <laughs> Don't sit back down. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I'm getting ready to do calisthenics. We've got a PE teacher right here so he can take care of us in case any of us fall out. But what I want us to do, we're going to sing two songs. And we don't have the mute words up there behind me, but I'm going to count on your memories. Let's see if you can do it. One of them is an old Baptist hymn. And you, so the Baptists should sing loud. The Methodists have just learned this thing. We've learned it in the last 20 years. Victory in Jesus, you know it. We're going to sing the first two stanzas together. So would you start us, please? I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made it lame to walk again. And he caused the blind to see And then I cried, dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior 
forever He sought me and He bought me With His redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew Him And all my love is due Him He plunged me to victory Beneath the cleansing flood And now just the chorus to He touched me touched me oh he touched me and all oh, the joy that flood my soul something wonderful and now I know he touched me and made Please be seated. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be turning tonight to the good gospel according to Luke, chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. Someone asked me what was the translation I had used on, my, on Sunday night, and I'm going to be using that same translation again tonight. It's called the Passion Translation. It's one of the new translations. In fact, it's still in the process of being translated. But I like the way it tells certain passages of Scripture particularly. And so from Luke chapter 18, listen to these words. As Jesus and his followers arrived at Jericho, a blind beggar was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard the crowd approaching, he said, what's all this commotion about? It's Jesus, they said. Jesus the Nazarene is passing by. The blind beggar shouted, Jesus, son of David. Have pity and show me mercy. And those in front of the crowd scolded him and warned him to be quiet. But the blind beggar screamed even louder. Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Suddenly Jesus stopped and directed those nearby, bring the man over to me. When they brought him before Jesus, he asked the man, what do you want me to do for you? Master, he said, please. I want to see. Jesus said, now you will see. Receive your sight this moment, for your faith in me has given you sight and new life. Instantly he could see again. His eyes popped open, and he saw Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together, and we thank you that your word is a good word. It's a holy word. It's a strong word, and it's a life-giving word. Lord, we ask that you would open our eyes that we might see what you have for us. And Lord, that you open our eyes, open our ears, that we might hear the good news of the gospel, and open our heart that it might be a fertile place so that the word would take root and bring about a good harvest. These things we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Several months ago, I had the opportunity to be in Oklahoma, and I went to a church that was a very high church. You know what I'm talking about? High church, big steeple. Everything they did was formal. Everything that you happened in the worship service was a formality. In fact, they had this great big cross that they had in the front. And when we began the service, they marched down the aisle. The choir came after them, and then the preachers came after that. It was something to see. It was a Methodist church, and I couldn't believe it. We almost had smells and bells. But uh, we didn't have to go that far. But the interesting thing was, that church had never had a healing service in its existence. And that church was over 175 years old. But they had called us and shared, asked me to come and share my testimony of healing. I gave my testimony that night, and at the conclusion of that testimony, I invited persons that wanted to be touched by Jesus to come forward. You know, the beautiful thing about being touched by Jesus is we don't tell God how to do it. We don't tell Jesus when to do it. We don't tell Jesus even where to do it. All we pray is, Jesus, do it. Turn around and look at the person next to you and say, Jesus is going to do it tonight. Jesus is going to do it tonight. 
because he is here and he's alive. And that risen Christ who's living in our hearts and in our lives is here to touch us at the deepest points of our need. Edward came to the altar that night and he had never been to an altar before. The only time he had come to the altar was when he got married. And then he'd come to the altar when he took communion. Because we Methodists, that's the only time we can get them on their knees. But we get them down there at least at that point. Right, Brother Kim? And so we got them on the knees. And so Edward had come and he was going to... He was waiting for me to get to him so he could pray about his particular need. When I got there, I looked at him and I said, Edward, what's your need tonight? And what do you want Jesus to do for you? And he looked at me and he said, well, when I came, I'm experiencing this extreme pain in my left hip. And he said, it runs all the way down my left leg. It's sciatica. It's the horrible thing. I said, it's been giving me the fits for several months. He said, I just can't get rid of it. And that's what I wanted you to pray about. He said, but as I've knelt here and I've been waiting, he said, all of a sudden, I don't think that's what I need to pray about. I said, no. He said, no. He said, I need to pray about my mom and dad. They both have dementia and they're going through the struggles of learning to cope with what it means to have dementia. They're going through the situation where sometimes they wake up at night, they look at each other in the bed and they wonder who this stranger is that's laying next to them. They go up to that point where they look at me and they wonder who in the world I am because I go in to see them every day. But he said, would you pray for my mom and dad tonight? So we prayed for his mother and father and asked the Lord just to clear their minds and allow them to live a more productive life and to be able to enjoy one another as well as their family. We did pray for that prayer and he told me afterwards that that prayer was answered that they did get a little bit better and they were having a better sense of it. They hadn't forgotten who each other were and they didn't even forget who he was there for a while. And that was wonderful. But do you know the beautiful part about this story? Is that, remember, what was it that he wanted prayer for when he came down the aisle? Control. Say, well, who? Himself. Himself. But what did he need the prayer for? Sciatica. Sciatica. You know, the interesting thing was Jesus healed him of sciatica before he got up off of his knees sitting at the altar. Because you see, Jesus is here to meet our needs. And he doesn't wait. He's here to meet our needs tonight. And he wants to touch each one of us. In the story that we've read tonight from the Gospel of Luke, this is Luke's version of the same passage that's in Mark and in Matthew. It's the healing of a man named Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus was a blind man. They've come to Jericho, <clears throat> Jesus and the disciples have, and there sitting on the side of the road is a blind man. And that blind man hears things going on, but he can't see what's happening, but he sure wants to know what's happening. Jericho was a place that was filled with faith. It was a place that the Jews knew well. Remember back in the Old Testament? Where was the first place that the Jews went when they crossed over the Jordan River? Where? Jericho. And what did they do? They marched around Jericho how many times? Seven times. That's right. Marched around it seven times. And what did they do when they marched around it seven times? Then what did they do? They were shouting Baptist. Because all of a sudden they shouted with a big shout and then they blew the trumpets. And what happened? The walls came tumbling down. You see, Jericho is a good place to be when you need a touch from the Lord. Because you see, it was also the place that an, Arama I mean, an Aramean by the name of Naaman had come. And he had been sent by his king because he heard that there was a prophet in Israel who could heal. And when he went to that prophet, he tried to get to see him and the prophet wouldn't even see him. And so the prophet simply sent word to him, go down to the Jordan River and duck your, dunk yourself seven times. They were Baptists and didn't know it. <laughs> seven times he went under. And then when he came up on the seventh time, do you remember what happened? All of the leprosy that had covered his body 
of Naaman was removed and he was skin was as, as soft as a baby's bottom. He is all new. He was completely transformed and healed by the precious touch of Jesus in the midst of that water. But you know, in that time, there was also a blind man that was sitting there. And while Bartimaeus was sitting there, he was wondering what was going to happen. In Jesus' day, if you were blind, it was pretty much a curse upon you. Because they didn't have all of these programs for persons with handicaps. And so what they had to do is, if you were blind, all you could do was to beg. And so Bartimaeus had learned to sit by the roadside and there to hold out his cup and wait for people to put something in it because he was totally and completely at the mercy of those who came by and those who, that he, who saw him. Bartimaeus heard a commotion going on and the first thing that he did is he said, what's going on? Since he couldn't see what was happening, he asked someone. And immediately they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Do you know that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by tonight? Do you feel his presence? Do you know that he has told us that where two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst? Turn around and look. Can you see him? Can you find him? Can you feel him? Because Jesus is here tonight. He's within this building. And as he's in this building, he's come to meet you and me. But who is this Jesus that's passing by? He's a wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the everlasting God. He's the eternal ruler. And the government of his life should be upon his shoulders. He's Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of the living God. He's Abel's sacrifice and Abraham's ram. He's Isaac's well and Jacob's ladder. He's Judah's scepter and he's Moses' rod. He's Joshua's ram's horn and he's Samuel's horn of oil. He's David's little slingshot and he's Hezekiah's sundial. He's Elijah's mantle and he's Elisha's staff. He's Job's prayer and Isaiah's fig tree. Ezekiel's wheel and Daniel's Jerusalem window. In Jonah, he's the sea monster. And in Malachi, he's the storehouse that never, ever runs dry. He is Peter's shadow, Paul's handkerchief and aprons. He's the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon in life's deserts. He's the pearl of great price and he's the rock for pilgrims in a weary land. He's the believer's justification. He's the believer's righteousness. He's the believer's sanctification. He's the believer's redemption. He's the believer's knowledge. He's the believer's wisdom. He's the believer's all in all in all. And he's the believer's completely complete completeness. He's the bright and morning star. And he is my Lord. And he is my Savior. He is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of David, who has pity and offers compassion. The blind man must have heard of Jesus because as soon as he heard who it was that was passing by, he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy and pity on me. How many of you tonight are come, have come with a need in your heart? You're bringing a need that's not only for you, but it's a need that you're bringing for somebody else. And yet inside, you know that Jesus of Nazareth is here. And Jesus of Nazareth is waiting to touch that need and to begin to work in the lives of those persons so that they might find the wholeness and the healing that God has for them. Jesus is coming here tonight and Jesus of Nazareth is one who is going to touch and he's going to transform and he's going to heal because that's what he does best. He is the healer, the one who touched me. You touched me and something wonderful happened and now I know. He touched me and made me made me made me 
made me whole. Are you ready for him to touch you tonight? Are you ready for Jesus to make you whole tonight? Are you ready for whatever the burden is that you brought in with you tonight to allow Jesus to lift that burden and to take it away? In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. That's what Jesus has come to do tonight. He's come to take our burdens. He's come to take that which we have struggled with and that which we carry and continues to hold us down. For Jesus is here tonight. And Jesus of Nazareth, be merciful and heal and with compassion touch us at the points of our needs. It was interesting when, they, when, um, when Bartimaeus began to cry out and claim and holler for Jesus, the crowd around him turned around and looked at him and said, Bartimaeus, be quiet. Don't cry. Jesus has got other things to do. He don't have time for you. Is that the way you feel tonight? Do you feel that as far as Jesus is concerned, he doesn't have time for you? That there are more important things that Jesus has got on his plate. And there are more important things that maybe he's working on and wondering about and touching. But he doesn't have time for you tonight. Well, the good news is Bartimaeus wouldn't be quiet. Because they told him to hush. Don't call Jesus. Don't worry him. Don't continue to call him. There are other people who need him more. And what did Bartimaeus do? He immediately began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Let me ask you, is that the cry of your heart tonight? Is that the cry of your life tonight? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on who? Me. me. Have mercy on me. Touch me. Transform me. Heal me. And make me whole. You know, we are self-made people for many times. We think we can do it all on our own. But you know, Jesus is the only one who can do everything in our lives. He's the only one who can make us whole. He's the only one who can bring us life and life everlasting. He's the only one who can bring us abundant life. And he's the only one who can bring us a life that is whole and never broken again. You see, Jesus is here, and he is being called on. Are you doing the calling, or are you like the crowd? Be quiet, Bartimaeus. Jesus doesn't have time for you. Because the good news is, Jesus has time for every one of us tonight. And he wants us to know that he has time for us. Jesus heard Bartimaeus' cry and he said, bring that man to me. Let me ask you, when's the last time you brought someone to Jesus? Hmm? When was the last time you brought someone to Jesus? Notice I didn't say when was the last time you came to Jesus, but when was the last time you brought someone to Jesus? When was the last time you brought someone in prayer because of the need that they were bearing and you couldn't bear it because they were struggling and they were hurting and the tears that they had were such that you couldn't stand it and you just had to cover them in prayer? When was the last time you brought somebody to Jesus? When was the last time you went by and picked somebody up on a Sunday morning and said, why, come on and go with me. I'll take you to lunch down at the Lotsburg Diner after the service. But we're going to go to church first because that's what we do. But then I'll pay for your dinner. Now that's going to cost you something, isn't it? How many Baptists here have got enough to spring for dinner? <laughs> Leonard, I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> When was the last time you knew someone and you invited them to come and go with you? Not invited them to come, 
but invited them to come and go with you to the house of the Lord, there to worship, there to praise, and there to be touched by Jesus of Nazareth, who is filled with compassion and filled with pity and filled with mercy and filled with grace. Jesus said, bring him to me. And Bartimaeus was taken to him. I know a young lady whose name was Missy. Missy was a part of our youth group at Pender Church in Northern Virginia. One night she went out, to, she had a date on Sunday night. And we had youth group every Sunday night. And so that was unusual that Missy would have a date on Sunday night because she wasn't going to go to church. She was going to go out and go to the movies. But Missy had all of a sudden told her about her date there was a problem. She had left her pocketbook at church that morning. And she couldn't go to the movies until they went back by church to pick up her pocketbook. They got to church and all of a sudden out in the parking lot, there were teenagers every which way you could look. And do you know what? That guy looked at Missy and said, well, let's see what they're doing. And so they got out of the car and they began to play the games that they were playing. And they began to share with each other. And that youth group began to talk to one another. And they began to talk to this boy who didn't know a thing about Jesus. The next Sunday night, the boy came out and took Nick Missy out. And he said, I don't want to go to a movie tonight. Let's go back to that place where we went last Sunday to get your purse. Did you leave it there again? And she said, yep, I left it there again. Missy knew how to work that boyfriend. Listen to that girl. <laughs> and got to that point, and they got back there, and after several weeks that had stretched into a month, that young man whose name was John came to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, all because somebody forgot her pocketbook at church. I don't know what you'll do, but Jesus is calling you to bring Bartimaeus to him. When's the last time that you brought someone to Jesus? Because that's what he's calling us to do tonight, to bring someone to see him. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 50, the, the story goes that the blind beggar, when he stood up, to go to Jesus, he pushed off his cloak and he left it behind and he went to see Jesus. That doesn't mean much to us. But you see, the cloak was that which a beggar used. It would identify him as a beggar and that you could know that he was a beggar and he was honestly begging and he wasn't just trying to scam people. How many have ever been to Richmond and seen Somebody standing there with a sign at a traffic light. I think all of us have. And when we do it, we want to help, but we don't want to get scammed and we don't want to give it if it's going to, not going to go for the proper purpose. But you see, in the ancient world, they had gotten around that. For the beggar's cloak was something that identified you immediately. There didn't have to be any questions about what your position was. And when he pushed it back and he let, let it drop, Bartimaeus knew and was saying by faith, I'm not going to be a blind man anymore. I'm not going to beg anymore. I'm going to go and I'm going to be healed because I believe Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. That beggar's cloak was one that he didn't have to worry about again. 1 Peter chapter 5 says, Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Where is your faith tonight? Are you ready to put off the beggar's cloak? Are you ready to put off that which is holding you back from receiving all that Jesus has for you tonight? Are you willing to let go of those things that would hinder you from receiving the fullness of of what God wants you to have. You see, faith in Jesus is what we step out and we believe. If Bartimaeus had sat there on his can and waited, 
for Jesus to come to him, would he have ever been healed? I don't think so. Because you see, when Bartimaeus stood up and Bartimaeus was led to Jesus, it was an act of faith. And God always requires an act of faith from us. He doesn't want to just do things on his own. He wants us to be participating with him. He wants us to share in the work that God has to do and that God wants to do. And he wants you to share in that. And he wants you to use your faith. For Bartimaeus, that meant standing up and coming to Jesus. How are you going to use your faith tonight? Will it be to stand when we sing the final hymn? And to take a walk down this aisle because you have a need that Jesus is going to touch tonight. That's that act of faith. That's where we're believing that Jesus is going to do something. Rather than just sitting and waiting and seeing if he's going to do something for somebody else. Because ours is a Jesus who wants to touch us at the point of our deepest need. Let me ask you, is there anybody in here tonight who doesn't have some kind of a need you don't have any need, you don't have any issues, you don't have any problems at all. Then everything that I have said so far is for you. Just for you. Because you see, Jesus wants you by faith to receive what he has for you. When the blind man got there, Jesus looked at him and what did he say? What? do you want me to do for you? Well, it was pretty evident, Jesus. He's blind. What do you think he wants you to do for him? But you see, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? I believe if that man had never said, I want my sight, he would have gone away blind. Because he said it was an act of faith to say to Jesus what it was that he needed and what it was that he wanted him to do for him. What do you, what do you, each one of you, you see, Jesus is not looking at us this, tonight just as a congregation. He's looking at us as an individual. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus knows that even the very hairs on the top of our head. Now, for some of us, he has to know a lot less than he does for some of the rest of you. But if he knows the hair on the top of my head, how much more does he know about my needs, my life, what I'm going through, what I'm struggling with? What do you, not your brother, not your sister, not your cousin, not somebody else, but what do you want me, want Jesus, Jesus? Jesus, there's something about that name. It's the name that has the power above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now look, Baptists should have said amen by then. <laughs> and the Methodists should have said it even if the Baptists didn't. Because he is Jesus, the name above every other name. And Jesus said, what do you want me? What do you want me, Jesus, the Son of God, to do for you? You know, it's not, what do you need to do for somebody else? Because their need may be worse than what you're dealing with. He doesn't say, what do you want me to do for that other person? Because their prayers are needed more than maybe you think your prayers are needed. No, he said, what do you want me to do for you? What did Bar Bartimaeus need? What did he need? He needed to be able to see. And so he said, Lord, I need to see. I want my sight. And Jesus reached out and touched him. And what happened? Instantly. 
Instantly, Bartimaeus saw. His sight was restored, and the first thing that it says, according to the Passion Translation, his eyes popped, and he saw Jesus. Tonight, my brothers and sisters, God's going to pop some eyes. And when he does, you're going to see the one who is standing there to touch you at the point of your deepest need, at the hurt and the pain that you're carrying around and have been carrying around. Because Jesus wants to meet you and he wants to do for you what nobody else can do. He wants to make you whole. When I was preaching in that same church that I shared about in the beginning, that morning we had had service, and there was a young woman whose name was Destiny. Destiny had come the day before, which they'd had food pantry. The food pantry was when, at that particular area, people could come and they could get bags of groceries if they had needs. And so they had come and gotten bags of groceries, but the church had decided since it was the 4th of July weekend, they were going to give them out hot dogs. Why did hot dogs ever get associated with the 4th of July weekend? I don't know. But they had a boatload of hot dogs, and so they had grills, and they had hot dogs, and they had buns, and they had everything that you could need. My friend who is pastor there says that he was sitting with uh, Destiny and her husband, Jeff, and he was talking to them, and in the course of the conversation, they talked not only about their need, particularly uh, they had come for food, but Destiny began to talk about her own personal need. For you see, Destiny had cancer. She had cancer of the colon, and the colon cancer had now gone in, into the liver, and that colon cancer that was in the liver was making her struggle. And she didn't know what to do and what was going to happen. She'd gone through the chemotherapies and she tried everything that they had given her. But nothing seemed to be helping. And that day, my friend said, well, we're going to be having a service where we're going to pray for the needs of people. And we're going to anoint them with oil because that's what the Bible says. That doesn't mean we're trying to be something different. We're just going to do what the Bible says. And the Bible says, if there be any sick among you, what are we supposed to do? Call the elders of the church. And when you call the elders of the church, what are they supposed to do? Anoint you with oil and pray over you the prayer of faith. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. So you know, Destiny and Jeff, they decided to come back on Sunday morning. I had the privilege of preaching that morning. And I was preaching and I had finished the preaching and we were praying for different people and we were watching what God was doing. We watched as one lady's leg was two inches shorter than the other one. And we watched as that leg just grew out. I wasn't the one doing the praying. There was two of the lay people that were doing the praying. And their leg actually grew out. You could see it happening. My pastor friend went to Destiny, and he began to pray for Destiny and for the cancer. And he began to pray that God would remove the cancer from her body, and that she would be made free, and that she would be made whole. Destiny had to go back to the doctor in two weeks because she had a scan coming up. And she told our, my pastor friend, she said, I'm not going to go back and have that scan until after they tell, I'm not going to have any more chemotherapy. That's what she said. I'm not going to have any more chemotherapy until they do that scan. And he said, well, you know, you know, Destiny, you better do that because God heals in many different ways. Sometimes he uses medicine. Sometimes he uses prayer. And sometimes he uses medicine and prayer. And she said, that's all right. I can go a week. That'll be all right. She went back and she had her scan. She told the doctor, I'm not having any chemotherapy until you give me the scan. Destiny had her scan, and do you know what it found? Where the tumors had been in her colon, and where the tumor had been in her liver, they had disappeared. Somebody should say amen to that. Because don't we believe or do you believe 
that our God is still in the miracle working business? Do you believe that the one who was raised from the dead and lives to give us life, new life, is here tonight so that we might find new life, wholeness, and healing? I called my friend Brian, who's the pastor of, get this, Will Rogers United Methodist Church. Now, that's a great name for a church, isn't it? I called Brian today, and I asked Brian, I said, has Destiny been continuing in church? He said, yep. She's there every Sunday morning. And said, usually during the time when we ask for prayer requests and joys, Destiny simply says, I give thanks for one more week that I am whole. I don't know about you tonight, but I'm like destiny. I have a need, and Jesus is passing by. And he wants me to act in faith so that he might do his work. We're not going to tell him how to do it, and we're not even going to tell him when to do it. But we're going to sure enough ask him to do it, because the Bible says, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. As we sing tonight, you're going to be able to seek, you're going to be able to ask, and you're going to be able to knock. And by faith, Jesus is here to touch you at the point of your need. Would you come? The hymn is softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Tonight as we sing, if you have a need and you want Jesus to touch that need, I invite you to come as an act of faith. Come to this altar and we're going to pray for you. Brother Bean, would you come and pray with me? Brother Kim, would you come? If you don't know Brother Kim, Brother Kim is the Methodist preacher at Melrose. And so it's good to have him with us. There's nothing special about each one of us. And we're not healers, but we are men of God. And we believe in the one who does the healing. And his name is Jesus. If you have a need tonight, I invite you to come. We'll pray and we'll see how Jesus works with compassion and mercy. Let's stand. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling Calling for you and for me Think of the portals He's waiting and watching Wedging for you and for me Come home Come home We who are weary Come home Earnestly, tenderly Jesus is calling Calling, O oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me?
wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have Kenny, I profess faith when I was alone.
you've been in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. And we know that Jesus has been here and he has been walking in our midst. And I hope that you've reached out and touched him and touched the hem of his garment, just like the woman did so long ago. Nobody asked her to do it. Jesus didn't even know she was getting ready to do it. But we can still call on his robe because that robe brings healing. Would you bow now for the benediction? Lord, we thank you for the time that we have shared together in revival and renewal. And Lord, we know that you have been here each evening. And you have touched our hearts and warmed our hearts. And we pray that as you send us now into our community, that people would see Jesus within us. That Jesus would radiate from us so that others might see him. And Lord, they might want to know him. And we have the opportunity to share him in every way. We pray that you would continue to be with each of us who has a need. And Lord, that you would touch that need according to the riches of your grace, the riches of your mercy, the riches of your compassion. And we ask now that you would send us from this place into the world, there to go not alone, but to know that you go with us. You go in front of us and behind us, to the right and to the left. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you would guide us to become all that you want us to be and to do all that you want us to do. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name, and all the children of God did say, Amen. Amen. Amen.